All right, guys, welcome back to the show. We're at one of our current Barnuminium builds right now. I got Trevor Buford from Hits Holzer Installation. We met at the NFBA this year, which is the National Frame Builders uh, Conference. It's all about post frame. And I saw this product and I went up and talked to him and here he is a couple months later. So let's talk about this product right here. Yeah, so our hit salter insulation is primarily for uh, below grade. Um, and as you can see, it's also primarily made for in-floor heating as well. Sure. So we've got a six by six inch grid here. So that's gonna help you out as far as if you are cutting the material, you can just cut along the lines, but also when you're laying your, your pecs for in-floor heating. So six inch grid helps you because um, whether it's residential on 12 sure. inch centers or commercial on 18 inch centers. Sure. Uh, that's also helpful. This is EPS foam, so um, doesn't waterlog or anything like that. Um, it does repel water. Our value as far as the product goes um, is going to depend a little bit on, on the density of the product. So we've got 15 PSI, 25 PSI, 40 PSI, and then 60 PSI. So um, it's going to depend on what PSI you're talking about, but it's usually anywhere between 4.2 to 4.6 is your sure. R value per inch. Um, so on a on a two inch product, you're about 9.2. Sure. Now, does that does it hold its R value basically through the life, or do you? That's correct. Yep. Okay. Uh, because it is EPS foam, it's not going to um, it's not going to compress. It's not going to degas. It's going to maintain its R value for residential. What is your guys' recommendation for PSI? For your typical residential house and then maybe just a regular garage? Yeah, um, I think 15 PSI is gonna take you all the way. That's a that's a typical recommendation for what we see. Okay. When you get into more of the commercial side of things where you're having bigger machinery on top of that, then you can jump up to the 25 or the 40. Sure. So maybe if somebody had a house with a big shop on it or something, maybe they're gonna put tractors or something in there, right. you maybe recommend that? Yep, okay. yep, and I would definitely consult engineering on, on some of those big, bigger projects projects where you are going to have heavier machinery on sure there. so it's got termiticide in it um, it's uh, the actual brand I believe is Preventol, and so we put the maximum amount in our product and that does a couple things for you number one it keeps bugs termites ants from burrowing so but, any bug correct okay the other thing is is it is a deterrent to rodents so if the if the product is being stored um, that definitely will deter them Oh, well, that's pretty cool. Um, one of the coolest things that really caught my eye with this was the built-in vapor barrier. So just talk about like how that works on this product. So we've got a three mil uh, poly layer on both sides. And uh, so our, our product is a four foot by 24 foot long fan fold and you never have a break in it. Um, we do recommend to tape the long seams and the butt end joints sure. um, when you are assembling our product. But um, having three mils of that vapor barrier on both sides in most cases is gonna qualify qualify for a vapor barrier. Sure. So eliminates the process of laying visqueen or a vapor barrier down, right. which cuts labor down, as you know, uh, significantly. The other thing that does cut the labor down quite a bit is the fact that it is a four foot by 24 foot fan fold section. Yeah. Now, if somebody wanted to put an additional vapor barrier under that, would that be a problem? Absolutely. That's fine. Okay. No, that's cool. I think that's one of the most, um, interesting parts to me because putting the plastic down is always a real pain and we always will bring in like fines from a quarry so it's smoother mm -hmm. less rigid rocks so there's less chances of it poking through all right. the, the plastic as you walk across and everything yep. so that's what's cool about it being on both sides too yeah so guys we are going to use this um, in this build here and uh, probably some builds coming forward and we'll tell you kind of what our thoughts of it are um, I'm the type of person that uh, I do a lot of research, I kind of think about it, and I'm pretty confident that I'm going to like this, just all the things that you get in one package. I mean, laying out your your packs, your rebar, not having to put that vapor barrier down, all that stuff is going to save time and, and money in the long run. So we're going to go in here and we're going to put it down, um, two feet down the sides of our building like we always do. You guys have seen me do that before. That's for frost protection on a foundation where we have piers, which is typically how we build our barnuminiums. And then once all the underground plumbing and electrics in, we'll come back and we'll do all of the in-floor heat. So we'll put this down and then attach all our in-floor heat tubing to it. So we'll show you all of that in this video. What is the big trailer? It is. Yeah, so they make these um, to sit under them so you don't damage the product. Sure. So you have an extra, you know, two inches. Sure. Um, makes it super, super yeah. easy. Oh, 
Watch your step there, Ken. Just go next to this other big one that we already put out. So we're going to have to cut these down anyway. Yeah. So you could do that. Um, the other thing, so one of, what I was going to say is I've seen where or the, the guys will fold, fold out the full 24 foot sheet and we've got those lines. So you just cut along, you, oh, you sure. can figure out where your center is and cut yeah. along that line. Do you want to use a table saw or do you want to use the circular saw? We try the circle. That's one of those, that, that one's probably the, but just make sure that the deer are facing upward. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate it. <laughs> They, they put stuff upside down on purpose to see them and I always say it's upside down it doesn't work. <laughs> Let's, we'll start on that and then just start in there. Yeah. And then I got cap nails. And then once we get it all done, then we'll backfill from both sides. <laughs> Typically what we'll do is we'll just lay it up there and notch out, sit down in there, it works out pretty good. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna talk about the frost protection we do. And on all of our residential buildings, we go 24 inches down around the perimeter of the building. And how we do that is we just dig down. We usually hand dig it 24 inches uh, below the finished grade. So we'll just take our 48 inch sheets and we'll rip them in half and that gives us two pieces that we can use to go around for frost protection. And what we'll do is we'll notch around the piers and take it up and then we use cap nails to secure it to the grade board. And then we take can foam, fill in along the piers where there's little gaps or anything just to seal that up. And then we backfill from both sides evenly so that it won't move the insulation um, back and forth. So that's basically how we do it. Um, and that should give you a substantial amount of frost protection for your slab. All right, so we have wrapped up all of the frost protection insulation, we showed you that. Um, it's been, I don't know, probably three or four weeks since we did that. We had to have the rough in plumbers come, the rough in electrical, and now we're back to put all of the insulation on the floor. Depending on what your plumbers and electricians do will depend on how much more work you have. Um, we try to get it all brought up to grade before they come in. So when they dig and all that, we're not having to like bring heavy equipment in here to bring more rock in. So we'll bring the compactor in, uh, we rake it out, uh, get it as smooth as possible, compact it, fill in any divots, compact it again, and then we are ready to start putting our insulation down. So if you can see um, the insulation behind me, this is the Hitzhalser insulation obviously we've been talking about. It's four foot by 24 foot long, and it's a fan fold. So it's in four by four sections that folds out to 24 foot length. So this building is 48 feet, so it's only gonna take me two pieces to go from one side to the other. So it'll be pretty quick um, installation. I guess things to think about when you're getting your area ready is you want it as uh, flat as possible. It doesn't have to be perfect, um, but you want to use a compactor and get all those jagged ed edges of rock flattened out. And if you, um, I'll have Justin uh, zoom in on spots where you can see how the rock has been flattened out so it won't puncture the vapor barrier. This product has a vapor barrier on both sides, so all we have to do is tape the seams. So we're gonna go ahead and lay our first piece out. I'm gonna notch it out, we'll slide it in there, and uh, we'll start getting all this down.
All right, guys, so we've got the whole house completed, and we're going to start working on the garage. And this product has six-inch grid lines on it. Um, the one issue that there is with uh, that is if you're running the 24-foot way, if you run your installation all the way across, you're going to have perfect six-inch lines to run your uh, in-floor heat tubing. Um, but when you run it, if you look at your six-inch grid lines, um, the other way, they aren't perfectly lined up unless you cut a little off of your board to start and line up your lines. It's just the way it's manufactured. It's manufactured in like continuous sheets and then the vapor barrier is rolled onto it, which is what has the six inch grid. So I went ahead and just laid the house down the way it laid and we're going to run all of our in-floor heat tubing just using the lines as rough reference lines. We're not going to necessarily uh, have a perfect line on the four foot wide dimension all the way across because they don't line up perfect. The garage, however, I'm going to cut off a little in the beginning to make sure the lines match up perfect. And then I'll tell you um, if I feel like that's worth it. It honestly is probably going to only take a few extra minutes um, to do that. So these are my two first, my first two pieces in the garage. Um, that one I just am setting it the way it lays. This one I had to cut like two inches off. And then if you come down here to this end, you will see I just cut it right at the line. So one of my next piece, I'll make sure that there's lines starting at the next piece and then it all the grid lines will line up. putting the insulation down, Jake Cash are finishing up taping all the seams, and then we're gonna start running our tubing. We had, uh, behind me you can see this trench, um, they decided to put a storm shelter here, and back in this corner is where the in-floor heat system was going to go, but there's gonna be concrete block walls. So we had to move the system over here, which would have ran all the house loops through the garage, probably, I'm guessing about 30 feet. So to avoid that, we're gonna run a remote manifold. So all of the house loops, are gonna be run off a remote manifold that's on the shared wall between the house and the garage. So how you do that is I'm running a three quarter inch supply and return line from the control system to the remote manifold and then all of the 300 foot loops will come off that remote manifold. That way uh, we don't have a whole bunch of extra lines running through the garage heating it um, if the client doesn't want to. So I'm gonna to try to get that done today, which I already almost have the supply uh, line done. And then tomorrow we'll run all of these lines in here and uh, this will pretty much be done, ready for concrete. All right, well, we have wrapped this up so I'm gonna go ahead and walk through this job, kind of show you guys what we did and how we did it, and then uh, we'll close this out. But got all of our in-floor heat tubing, which we'll talk about. Um, this will be where the remote manifold is. And like I said, the original plan was, it for, was for it to go over there, but they're gonna put concrete foundation and block wall up in this corner. So that eliminated that and it moved the main utility and uh, controls over there. So what we did is the garage zone will come off here and then you can see there's two three quarter inch um, lines here, which this will be the supply and return to the remote manifold. And then we have, I believe it's seven loops. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven loops serving the house. So this will just be a remote manifold. It'll only take up a couple feet here. Um, I think he's going to plan on putting a workbench here so it'll hide right nice and neat under there. Um, that way, the reason I chose to do this is because then all of those lines for the house aren't running through here, heating this space um, unnecessarily because maybe the client won't want to heat the garage as high as hot or 
maybe they won't want it on at all. And if the house is running, it is going to heat this up and waste some of the BTUs. So here they all go right down, poke out the wall on this side, and it serves the whole house. So this insulation we use, it's Hitz Halter insulation. It's an EPS foam like we talked about at the beginning of this video. It's got all the grid lines on it. I told you that I did the house differently than I did the garage. So what I mean by that is I just laid the boards out the way the grids uh, landed. And so most of our lines are run this way, which all of our six inch lines are completely um, perfectly straight, but I just laid these the way they landed and you can see It's hard to see but they're not quite lined up um, If you do in-floor heat enough and you know which way most of your runs are primarily going to run, it's fine um, I don't feel like it was hard for us uh, To run the tubing anything like that, but then in the garage I took the time and cut off like an inch or two at the beginning just to get those lines all perfect. Um, and I would say if you don't do, if you're just doing it for yourself, um, I would do that. You're not wasting any extra material. You just have maybe one uh, to two cuts per row extra, um, but you're, you're wasting the same amount of material. So you can see in the garage that they all line up both ways perfectly which if you're OCD like me, you'll like it, but I wanted to show you both ways. Um, it takes a little extra thought to do that, but it's not hard at all. And I would say it's worth it. Um, that is not a deal breaker for me anyway with this, uh, this product. I, f I found this, I did the research on it, and then I went to them and said, hey, I really like uh, the concept behind this, all of the different qualities of it. I felt would be very useful for what I do and for barnuminiums. I mean, it just has so much included in one package. It saves time on not having to put the vapor barrier down. You just have to tape the seams. Um, it's got your grid lines on it. It's got terminicide in it. It's, it's mold resistant. It's everything you need in an in-floor heat insulation package. Um, one thing that I wasn't expecting with this is this is a four foot by 24 foot fan fold. So it cut one piece covers 96 square feet and the uh, folds are every four feet. So one thing that um, I thought was really cool is when I laid it out over the floor, it sat much flatter because every four feet there was a, um, a break so it could sit flatter with your floor. You're never gonna be able to get your level absolutely perfect. And one thing, if you're using like a four by eight sheet with your typical underground insulation, um, you'll, you'll, when you walk on it, you'll feel there's more, um, like if it's not perfectly level, you'll feel that insulation sink. Now, it's not a big deal, but it is nicer when it sits flatter. So that was an unexpected thing um, that I found with this. And when you put, like, just take this room, for example, there's probably gonna be 175,000 pounds of concrete on this. So it's gonna uh, form to the ground just fine. And there's not gonna be any issue. But as far as laying it out, laying your tubes, it's nice that it kind of lays flat like that. So um, I used a couple different um, types of tape on this. Um, I tried and I really like this force field tape. It's actually, I think it's three and a half inches wide. It sticks real good. Um, it's pretty thick and durable. Um, Hip Halter does not have their own tape, which uh, they'll probably eventually come out with it. I don't know, but this, um, tape right here worked excellent. And like I said, it's George Pacific force field. It's a weather barrier system. Uh, zip tape would work amazing on this. Uh, zip tape is really sticky. It's a weather barrier tape, so that would work as well. Um, any tape you're gonna use is gonna be pretty comparable in price. Uh, this is kind of similar to a, a zip tape. Um, same width, uh, real sticky. So since this has your vapor barrier built in, it's built in on both sides. Um, so when you have these staples, it's not gonna affect your vapor barrier, but you do have to tape all the same. So every four feet, you're gonna have a taping seam. And then where 
your butt joints are, you're going to have to tape it. And then we went around and taped all the corners. So there is more taping involved than if you were going to lay down plastic. Um, however, it is a, a really nice, good result. That's just one thing to keep in mind. You want to make sure you tape all this off real well. Around all of our like plumbing penetrations, we just fill in with spray foam. We try to make these cuts the best we can, and then we'll just fill in with spray foam. See there. All right, couple more things. Here is where uh, they have a drain. So we'll usually leave our insulation back a foot all the way around that way. This drain probably sits, I'm not sure I didn't do it, but typically, depending on how far you're gonna slope, will sit a couple inches lower than the finished floor. So I always leave that open so that more concrete can get down there and you won't have a weak point. Um, garage door openings. So the way we like to do this is the concrete will come all the way out to here. So you can run, um, you can run two feet down along here if you like. And then I stop the insulation right here. So when the concrete's gonna be five inches, this is gonna be five inches thick, so it'll come out here, and then it'll drop down here. So this'll be a nice thick um, edge right here where there's gonna be a lot of um, pressure in and out. And I don't like, I don't want my foam coming all the way out here because I want this to be good and solid right here where the garage door opening is. So I just run it straight across from here. To there. Um, I typically, I don't think it's necessary to run your insulation board down two feet. Um, you're not going to, you're not going to have a problem, um, but a lot of people do it. Um, it's not going to hurt to do it. Um, it's just kind of a pain, but I do get that question. Should I run it across there? And it's not going to hurt you to run it across there. I do not have any down across on my house and I've never had any issues. That doesn't mean you can't do it and it's wrong to do it. There's a lot of different ways to do things and you'll notice about one thing about my channel is I just tell you guys how we do stuff, why we do it. If you wanna do it that way, that's great. If you have a better way or something else works better for you, that's fine as well. As far as all of our manifolds, I use one inch EMT conduit. Um, I put a two by four in here to space these off the wall. Um, that way, like whatever they're using to finish the interior wall, they'll have room. So once the concrete is poured, they can take all these off, slide whatever finish they want in behind there, and then these will all be encapsulated in concrete. These protect the tubing. I always fill the tops and the bottom with spray foam, so little pieces of rock, sand, whatever, can't fall down in there and over time wear a hole in these pipes. Same thing over here. Fill them all. I set this to the concrete grades. The concrete will be finished right here. Um, they can unhook these at the end and they'll be able to do whatever they need to do behind there. Um, then we'll come in at the end and hook all of this together. So I have all of those hooked together, the line goes up and over, comes, connects here, and then I run a piece of pipe all the way out with a homemade gauge, pressurize it to 50 PSI, check to make sure I have no leaks, which we don't have any leaks, but I will leave this all hooked up, then when the concrete company comes, we will get an air compressor here. I'm not doing this, but I will leave this here for the client to do. They can keep this pressurized. If they lose pressure, they can hook an air compressor up to it, pump a bunch of air into it, and then say there was a leak right here, maybe they damaged it somehow, the concrete would bubble, they could dig it out, um, put a repair coupling in there, and then you don't lose this line. I have personally never had one break during a pour. But I will tell you, one of our patrons, uh, Dirk Wickard, I built his building. He did his own in-floor heat and all that. Um, he pressurized it like this, and during the pour, um, I think one of the guys hit it with a shovel 
or something broke the line and he was able to locate it from the bubbling concrete, dug it out, cleaned it off, put a repair, brass repair coupling in there, and he was able to save that line. So it's worth doing. Um, it is a little bit of money in the brass fittings and the crimps and all that, which you can use again later because you're gonna cut all of them off, but it's worth not losing a line. It wouldn't be the end of the world if you lost one, but you don't want to. So good idea to pressurize your lines during the concrete pour. I'm very happy uh, with the way this went and I, going forward, this is what I'm gonna use. There's just so many more benefits to it. When, for example, when I'm cutting out these uh, pipes, having all these grid lines, it's easy for me uh, to know kind of roughly where I'm gonna be. If I measure from that, that piece over there to the pipe and it's 24 inches, I know I have to go five squares and that's roughly where it's going to be. So it is quicker um, as far as getting your holes uh, marked, cut. I mean, all those are little things, but they all add up to a really uh, great package. So hopefully you guys found this interesting. Hopefully you found it helpful. Another benefit, benefit of this is this is an EPS foam. So it's made from styrofoam balls and water, there's no chemicals in the making of this um, from my understanding for what um, they told me. And on top of that, uh, they recommend for like residential, uh, residential garages a 15 PSI, which gets your costs way down compared to having you to use a 25 PSI. I think, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I know the XPS foam that I was using before recommended 25 PSI for below uh, concrete applications, which is uh, much more expensive than a 15 PSI. Now, I will tell you, this feels just as dense as the 25 PSI I was using before. So kind of what we're doing is we're kind of figuring out um, if it's outside of a residential use so if it's for a shop we're figuring out hey what are you using your shop for what is the heaviest piece of equipment in there and then if we need to we'll step that part up to a 25 psi so if anybody is interested in any of this uh, you can email us design at mr post frame some things we'll need is we'll need your building size uh, so for example 48 by 48 uh, we'll need to know if you want the insulation for frost protection, which is two foot down the side for mostly, most of the country is gonna be that. Um, so we can figure linear feet. If it's a part of your building as a shop, we'll need to know what the use is. We'll need your address, uh, shipping address, phone number, and we can get you a price on this, uh, drop ship to your location and um, try to help you guys out. But hopefully this video was helpful um, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments and we will do our best to answer them. As always, thanks for watching. If you haven't, hit that subscribe button and we will catch you on the next video.